Hello, welcome to the Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. With this unique format, which is realized in partnership with the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, as well as Springer Nature, we have created an intimate space for interaction with global science leaders and outstanding scientists. My name is Alina Schadwinkel. Uh, I'm managing editor online for Spectrum der Wissenschaft. And I may spend the next 20 minutes with you. Um, and it's really good that you're here because you're encouraged to actively participate in this dialogue oriented session. Um, please engage in discussions with our guests. Uh, just use the raise your hand option on Zoom and my colleagues from tech will let me know if there's a question coming up and I will include this as quick as possible in our conversation and I will try to fit in as many as possible. Yes, it's my honor now to welcome Marianne Moraithi. Thank you for being here. You are uh, one of the Falling Walls female science talents and your work focuses on studying multiple social behavioral environmental and biological factors associated with the increased susceptibility to sexual transmitted infections. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot, isn't it? Um, so there are a couple of topics we could talk about today. Um, but I would like to talk about your groundbreaking work on the development of vaccines and new technologies to combat um, the AIDS epidemic and other STIs. Um, also, I would like to focus on the situation of women in sub-Saharan Africa, as you're a female scientist there based in Nairobi. Um, Marianne, so great to have you here. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and to be invited. Um, my first question on December 1st, um, there's always a day called World AIDS Day. It's the official day. Um, what does this day mean to you? Actually, that's one of our biggest days in our calendar, December 1. And also there's HIV vaccine day at some point next year. And at this day, particularly the one that's coming up, we try and bring back the conversation on HIV virus and how it changed our landscape in Africa and also the world many years ago, around 40 years ago. Until today, we're still talking about this virus. We're still trying to get ahead of it, get solutions get vaccines and also highlight how far we have come. We, many years ago, I lost a lot of family members to this virus and now people are living longer. We have interventions, we have um, medications, drugs, and we are actively involved in getting an effective vaccine. So a lot has been achieved despite the gloom and doom of many years ago. And we like to highlight all those successes, some of the failures, and I don't want to call them failures, particularly when it comes to vaccines, because we have tried around 20 vaccine candidates and we like to highlight that from each vaccine trial, we get closer to the solution because it gives us some information that we didn't know before. So World AIDS Day, December 1, is when we go back to the community, go back to the world and tell them, hey, we are still working on this virus. The virus is still there. There are interventions and there are solutions that if we can all work together, we'll get ahead of it and get finally the cure to HIV virus. Thank you so much for emphasizing that there actually have been solutions found and that there have been, has been a lot of progress mm -hmm. in research. Um, I mean, HIV prophylaxis is considered a huge success, for example, and it's a crucial tool in ending the pandemic. Um, how well do these drugs work, actually? Yes, so we are quite excited to have prophylaxis and um, they're used in several um several scenarios and I'd like to talk about actually they are one of the preventative strategies that we try and advocate and because of this um, we get more populations particularly the most susceptible within our groups protected how they work they give the body some extra protection if in case you come across the virus you you, you maybe engage in some activities that make you exposed to the virus this prophylaxis you've been taking them over a period of time maybe because of the activities you engage in and they give your body an extra charge or an extra 
immunity to be able to fight this virus before it infects the, some target cells. We are very interested in these cells because we want to understand how HIV penetrates and initiates infection. So these HIV prophylaxis are able to prevent those processes from happening. Hence, you don't get that infection and you're protected. But again, Apart from this HIV prophylaxis, there are many other interventions that are there. Mm -hmm. And we always try to emphasize, if you're going to engage in some activities that may expose you, yes, there are prophylaxis. There are other interventions such as um, 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 condoms, for example, mm -hmm. which are also readily available if the prophylaxis are not there. And that way we are able to spread this message to the population that they can take an active role in preventing um, this infection from happening at the first instance. And we are really grateful that with this teamwork that we have with the pharmaceutical companies, with the communities, with the governments, because they play a big role in, make, in, in making sure that these inf interventions are readily available to the people that need them most. And also allow me to talk about um, some interventions that may not be very well acceptable, i.e. the condoms. Some people may not be very comfortable in mm -hmm. using that. And maybe because their partners are also not very um, comfortable with using um, these interventions. And th when it comes to this prophylaxis, they're discreet and this person can protect themselves. Again, emphasizing on what I just said, that they can take an active role in making a personal decision in protecting and giving them that chance of living a much healthier and mm -hmm. happier life, knowing that they are in charge of their health. So having this at hand, um, how has um, the situation of the pandemic changed within Kenya, where you work, within the last years or maybe even decades? Oh, I think this will be a conversation we can have for many years to come. The, yeah. co the COVID pandemic really shifted a lot of things to many people. And uh, maybe if I, if I can focus on terms of sexual and reproductive health, um, we had, first of all, the lockdowns, mm -hmm. meaning people may not have access to their healthcare facilities at the right time. Maybe some are shut down or some had reinvented themselves to be able to provide care for the current uh, the, the pandemic itself. Again, we experienced quite a lot of shortages because, again, there was, a sh uh, um, a, I think, a haltation of, of transport and ship. Mm -hmm. So I read some news reports that we were running out of some condoms as well. Mm -hmm. And again, allow me to also talk about um, during the lockdown, we had many people at home, young girls at home, not in school, mm -hmm. not engaged in very active activities, uh, which maybe uh, would have contributed to their personal growth or educational growth. And with that, we saw a high rise of sexually transmitted infections. Okay. And not just that. We also saw a high number of teenage pregnancy mm -hmm. or pregnancies that had gone uh, a bit above the normal rates that we had seen in our country. And it, it was because of these several factors. And if you see high rise of, uh, of pregnancies, it, it means people are having unprotected sex. Yes. And again, that's why we were seeing also a high rise of sexually transmitted infection. I remember speaking to some of my colleagues and one of them told me for the first time in their careers, and they've been working as medical doctors, us for many years, mm -hmm. they started treating syphilis. They had okay. not seen syphilis in all their uh, medical careers. So meaning, again, um, the pandemic really shifted our vision, our the things we had achieved. And um, we are now trying just to pass back the message to the people. And that's why, again, back to your question, mm -hmm. World AIDS Day is to make sure that HIV has not gone. Yeah. It's still there. It mutates. Mm -hmm. And we need to keep up in protecting ourselves, talking about this virus, and also talking about the science of it, talking about we are actively working towards a vaccine that will protect everyone. But before that, we have several interventions that people need to be aware about and also make sure that they're readily available. So also engaging policymakers, the governments, the NGOs to make sure that let's focus back to the matter at hand. Yes, there's COVID, but we still need to go back to basics, to HIV and talk about prevention and give this really susceptible people, particularly the young girls and women, yeah. I'm very passionate about that, <laughs> yeah, um, we'll some, that some protection and also chance to, you know, thrive yeah. and, 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 and 
achieve their potential. Yeah. Yeah. So you said there's still a lot of questions um, about HIV, how it functions, the way it mutates. Um, what exactly is your research focusing on when you work with HIV viruses? Yes. So there are various aspects of HIV that my colleagues, we work as a team again in science, we cannot work alone. And my team at the University of Nairobi and in collaboration with several partners, we are interested in the earliest events of HIV transmission. What barriers are there between the body and the virus before it initiates infections? Remember, it needs some immune cells such as a CD4 T cells, now going really deep into the immunity. And before it reaches these cells, it has to cross several biological barriers. One of them is the secretions the body produces, the mucosal barrier uh, around the, uh, the, the female and male genital tract. And we're very interested to know, does this barrier function? Of course, maybe it does not function because again, this person gets infected. What is the function of these secretions? And if we know the function of these secretions, can we have a vaccine that boosts the protection or the factors that may prevent this virus for, from initiating that infection? So what we do, we have a cohort of several um, for, for me in particular, we young women and girls, we collect some samples from them, from their um, the female reproductive mm -hmm. tract, that is the secretions. We also do swabbing to really understand this environment so that when we have the intervention, when we have the vaccine, it will be able to boost some of the factors that may prevent the virus from initiating the infection. So far, we've been able to really understand even the role of the mucus, you yeah. know, the secretions in terms of, 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 of slowing down the virus from reaching or penetrating these very important cells and then preventing it from initiating infection. So we've been able to discover several factors that we, that is now contributing to how we design vaccines. And this is a yeah. completely new approach or has this been approach been there before? It's, uh, I could say it's a new approach because we've been looking at the body, yeah. looking at these cells and looking at how the virus infects the cells. But then we are going a step even further before that process happens. Okay. How can we prevent the virus from penetrating? Mm -hmm. And if it penetrates, how can we create a barrier that prevents it from initiating that infection? But isn't so that exciting? I it's mean, it's been, exciting. again, decades of research and still you found another angle um to me that gives hope actually and, and to secure that there will be a vaccine one day um i mean probably weird question to ask but What do you do you think there will be a vaccine one day? Oh, definitely. There'll be maybe not just one vaccine, several vaccines okay. that will boost various arms of the immune system. Mm -hmm. The immune system is also very complex on how it works. And for us, we are interested in having a vaccine that will elicit or ex or, or um, stimulate all these arms of the immune system pro to protect this person from in, uh, getting this infection. And will this vaccine come out of Africa? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> so as I mentioned uh, initially, we work as a team. Mm -hmm. So we have African scientists, we have scientists from the United States, from Europe, from all parts of the world. And we work together in terms of understanding this virus. Mm -hmm. We have African or uh, people from sub-Saharan Africa also participating in terms of cohorts, the people getting these vaccines as well in terms of the vaccine trials. So everyone has a role to play not just the scientists but the populations mm -hmm. and that way we also create a way to trust the products that are coming to the people we saw the big problem when it came to vaccines when yeah. it, ca it came to covid that people had trust issues like these vaccines have been developed in the west and uh, this is now a situation we saw in africa mm -hmm. where do you want to give it to us who made it how are we going to respond to it yeah. so we are trying to debunk how science is done that everyone plays a role before these vaccines are rolled out the people the populations the people that need them most also participate in these vaccine trials mm -hmm. and the results we get from there help us get a really safe and efficacious vaccine so it's not just coming from africa yes 
we are on the table, but mm -hmm. also everyone has a role to play in terms of this development. And if I understood you correctly, it's not only about developing the vaccine, but also being transparent about your work and how yes. you do it yes. and to communicate that to the people. Yes, that's very crucial. Um, you mentioned it yourself, um, girls and young women in Africa have a special role um, in terms of STIs and um, so maybe you can just tell us a bit about the HIV STI situation, especially for women in sub-Saharan Africa. Yes, as if you look at the global reports, the highest rates of these infections of STIs of pregnancies are normally seen in sub-Saharan Africa. And that's why one of the many reasons, personal reasons, I, I really get, got in, interested and invested in trying to get solutions, understanding these young girls and women, what factors I, I make them susceptible to these infections. What factors are these? Yes, um, okay, so there are several factors. There are biological factors, and that's where I'm actively involved, trying to understand the, uh, the female reproductive tract. There are also social factors, you know, in terms of um, maybe not having a voice to say no, mm -hmm. um, poverty as well. So Many other, so those are the social, biological, environmental factors. Now we are talking about the environment, climate change. How is this environment being influenced by what is going around? Uh, what is going uh, around uh, within our climate? What are we eating? Our dietary nutrition approaches affecting again the female genital mucosa, the different cells that I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Are they being under suppressed? Are they um, getting um, more susceptible? to infection, that's what we're really interested in. Allow me also to throw in contraceptions. Mm -hmm. We've seen data coming in in that some contraceptions make the female more susceptible to this infection in that it probably um, um, the hormonal changes that this contraception brings may change the environment. The genital mucosa, some of the cells, makes it a bit more thinner and more vulnerable to infection. Mm -hmm. So again, we're trying to understand these contraceptions Some of them have been banned in the Western world. Again, that's another con uh, conversation altogether. Yes. But it's some of these contraceptions that are banned are still used within our sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. So we really want to debunk, do they do what uh, they're meant to do or are they making our women more susceptible to infection? And if they are, can we get better intervention. So again, to help our mm -hmm. women and young girls to thrive. Remember I mentioned about the high rates of teenage pregnancies yes. within our population. What is making these girls not say no? Um, are they maybe more actively engaged in their mm -hmm. education? Are they going to school? So all these factors make our women and young girls probably slightly more susceptible to these infections. And we want to change that narrative. And uh, in my space, in science, in vaccine research, I feel I can have a, a big influence in terms of um, helping our young girls and women thrive. I'm pretty sure you do, yeah, obviously. Indeed. And being a science communicator, um, as far as I know, you also do videos, you talk to the public, you explain your work, um, and that sure will help um, in, in informing them. Um, you were mentioning that um, it's it's they st one started to monitor um, what actually are factors? Um, do you like? What are the latest findings on that? Like, why? Uh, how is? Um, sorry for picking my brain here for the for the right vocabulary. Um, so, how is the school system developing? What are um, commercials? Maybe how do you inform the young public to stay safe? Yes, so again, it's a multi-functional uh, approach mm -hmm. where we have uh, policymakers, NGOs, scientists, educationalists, all sitting on one table. And um, in, in my space as well, the, the team I work with at the University of Nairobi, um, we have communities, community advisors and boards. We meet regularly. We have mm -hmm. a team that's on the ground that goes to the actually where these girls are and pass messages. So that's a World AIDS Day is very important mm -hmm. to us. In fact, before I came in, I was uh, on an email with a team in Nairobi that is preparing uh, for World AIDS Day. We have now interested partners from big pharmaceuticals, me to mention one of them, um, uh, Gilead wants mm -hmm. to also get involved in helping us pass the messages to the population within Kenya, the urban areas, the, the 
places we call slums and really talk about what we can do to prevent infection. That's, so that's advocacy. Mm -hmm. Other interventions is looking at what else can we do to make sure that these girls not just um, know about HIV but other sexually transmitted infections. And we have a very big weapon here. Mm -hmm. We have the H. PV vaccine. Yeah. Yes. But now what we have a, we have a problem about HPV vaccine in that okay. people don't know about it. Okay. And then also there's a lot of misinformation. Yeah. And if you look at um, the reports, some of the information comes down to fertility. That, oh, they're giving you these vaccines uh, to curb population within Africa. It's one of these typical yes. myths, isn't it? And it's yes. not just in Africa. It's, it's also, you can hear about that in Europe too. Yes. Um, Last question, because we're actually at the end of our talk here. It's such a shame. <laughs> um, but um, we talked about how, you know, to get a prophylax to not transfer, uh, transmit any diseases. Um, but also often people know that they got something, but they are scared to tell because it's a stigma mm -hmm. to have um, HIV or some other STI. How would you encourage people that maybe know they are infected or that not sure if they got something but don't feel quite right, how to speak up, who to turn to, what's the right thing to do? Yes, that's a complex question because again of the stigma. You got one minute left. To yes, it's a it. complex question. <laughs> and how to, uh, to maybe encourage people, get fast tested, know your status. Okay. Out there, there are now discrete tests that you can even take in your home and this house available within our setting. Mm -hmm. And once you turn positive, we have various counseling sites, VCT sites, they're free of charge, trained counselors that are on the ground that can help you walk that journey of how to protect yourself and protect others. There are interventions such as uh, antiretroviral um, drugs that can help you live a very healthy life, look after your diet. And again, through counseling, you can be able now to maybe open up to the society, your family, spaces that you trust. Mm -hmm. And that way, you know, not just protect yourself, but also others around you. People are living longer now because of the interventions of what science has done. So it's not all uh, a death sentence like it was many years ago. So I just want to encourage people, there are places, there are spaces, safe spaces that can help you overcome the stigma. And again, back to World AIDS Day, I guess some of those um, places will be highly um, um, sh uh, highlighted during that time. Thank you, Marianne, one of Falling Walls female <laughs> science talents. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, now it's time for a break. Refill our cups, your glasses. And um, well, you may stay on Zoom or you just take a quick break, as I just mentioned, and come back to us um, and meet our next guest in five minutes. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you. Um, It's been a pleasure. It's been an honor to talk about science and things that you're passionate about. So thank you very sure. much. Welcome.